Well, good morning again. It's Pastor John Raymer from Grace Point Church in Mundelein, Illinois. This morning, we're going to continue our study in the Book of Romans. This will be our second study, found in chapter 1, verses 8 through 15. I mentioned this last week, uh, just briefly again, a little journal uh, of the Book of Romans. It's only Romans. It's the text on one side and blank on the other side. It's $5.99 on Amazon, a Romans ESV journal. You can follow along and then take notes all the way through the series, and then you have it in one form. Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Romans raises the question, what is our purpose, especially our text this morning? Uh, what is your purpose in life? John Kennedy, when he was president, said, efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. Every human being needs clear purpose in life. It is our starting point. It's what sets our direction. It gives us clear understanding of what's important and what is not. It keeps you from frittering away your life in things that are pointless and unimportant. A purpose is what gives us meaning. Uh, inner drive, passion, uh, to help us achieve what we consider success in life. What is your purpose in life? Where are you headed? Uh, what's the point uh, of what you are doing? The Apostle Paul was very much a purpose-driven man. He was on a mission from God to share the grace of God with all people. Well, Paul, an apostle, he wanted all of his readers in the letter of Romans and us also, as we read this letter, to join with his purpose. Why did Paul write this letter to the church in Rome? Uh, he wrote uh, 13 letters. Uh, this letter is the only one written to a church that he didn't plant and he hadn't visited when he wrote this letter. Does it matter what his purpose is why well, it does because authorial intent is the key to understanding any document any letter any movie any book why did the author write what he or she uh, wrote what was their specific purpose what did they leave out what did they include uh, where were they trying to take us now the apostle paul didn't sit down and say well i've got a spare a couple of days so I'm just going to jot uh, some theological ideas down and send them off to the church in Rome. No, not at all, because intent is the key to meaning. Now, before we look at our text this morning, chapter 1, 8 through 15, which is the second half of his introduction, last week we looked at 1 through 7, and then starting next week in chapter 1, 16 and following, we get into the body of the letter. We're going to spend a little time this morning actually more time in the sermon, uh, considering his circumstance, his situation, uh, why he wrote what he wrote, and what he said his purpose was. Because when we have a clear understanding of his purpose in writing the letter to the church in Rome, then we will have a better understanding in reading it. Every piece uh, fits together in the whole and makes sense of the section when we know what the entire picture is. If you ever do jigsaw puzzles, you know that each piece can be beautiful, but it only makes sense part of a bigger picture. And that's what you're putting together with the pieces, that bigger picture. And that's what purpose is. Now, last week we saw that Paul turned a conventional greeting in a Greco-Roman letter. It usually said, from Paul to the church in Rome. Uh, they always started who the author was and who it went to because they were on a scroll and you couldn't put your name at the back of the scroll because you'd have to unroll the whole thing to read it. And then he had this packed full, packed full of meaning introduction of who he was. Now, he continues in this Greco-Roman style of a conventional greeting, but again, he expands it. Uh, after the letters of the day, dear Paul, to the church in Rome, uh, the typical Roman greeting after that was greetings and good health, or my sweetest father, many greetings. Those are from actual Roman letters. But in this case, Paul turns that short expression of relationship 
and expands it out and gives us a better sense of his purpose. He moves from facts about who he is as an apostle in the gospel to a, a verb-driven expression of longing, his deep emotion, his desire before God to connect with the church of Rome. And it's this passionate expression that helps us understand more clearly what his purpose is. So I'm going to read the text, and if you have a Bible with you, open it to Romans chapter 1. We'll start reading at verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I wanted you to know, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as those among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Now, I'll give you right now what my understanding is. Uh, some commentators and scholars uh, express it in uh, different ways. Uh, some say there isn't a clear purpose. Uh, I would beg to differ. And here is my understanding, and I hope that as we study Romans, uh, you'll see that it's an accurate uh, understanding. Because understanding the purpose, again, like putting a jigsaw puzzle together when we know the big picture we know where the pieces fit and we know why they belong there so this is what i believe is paul's purpose for writing the letter to the romans and it's this for god to be glorified by a united missionary church which has been transformed by faith in the grace of jesus christ let me say that again for God to be glorified by a united missionary church, which has been transformed by faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. So now I want to help you understand how I arrived at this conclusion. And then hopefully as we go through Romans, uh, you'll see this framework will make sense of each of the pieces. So where and when did Paul write uh, the letter to Rome? It was uh, almost assuredly written in spring of AD 70, uh, right here at this city in Corinth in southern Greece. Uh, we know that on his third missionary journey, he spent uh, three months there. It was a city he had visited before and planted a church. Uh, Paul's three missionary journeys was a, a 10 year burst of incredible uh, energy where he walked all through the Eastern Roman Empire three times. Uh, planting churches while ever he went. And you see it in the book of Acts. He suffered beatings, uh, imprisonment, riots, shipwrecks. He was stoned and left for dead. Unbelievable effort and suffering because of his commitment to purpose. Now he states uh, at the end of Romans in chapter 525 that he will be leaving where he is in Corinth to go to Jerusalem. He has from these churches that he's founded uh, collected money because many of the believers down here in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers who had become Christians, were ostracized uh, by their families and cut off. And so they were very poor. And he was taking a large collection uh, of offerings from these grateful churches who had come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ uh, to their brothers in Christ, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. That journey is recorded in Acts 20 and 21. So here Paul sits before he leaves for Jerusalem in Corinth. He's now been a, an apostle and church planner and evangelist uh, for almost 25 years. And of the 13 letters that are in the New Testament that Paul wrote, this is the only letter written to a church that he had not planted nor uh, been to. He had a brilliant mind and a soft pastor's heart. He was communicating God's truth uh, with an eye to the situation, uh, to communicate what theological truths would apply uh, to a given situation in a church or a city. He was literally an inspired genius. 
uh, who brought truth to bear in each one of his letters. Now, it took time and a great expense to communicate letters, to write letters in, in those days. Uh, a long letter, you would create a first draft to an amanuensis, that is a professional scribe, uh, they would bring it back to you, hand it back to you, and then you would make corrections, and then they would make a final copy on a scroll, uh, sometimes of parchment, uh, but the better ones that lasted longer were letters. And we actually know the name of the man who wrote, actually did the physical writing of Romans in chapter 16, verse 22. His name is Tertius. So he wrote this letter that Paul uh, dictated. Now, what do we know about Rome? Uh, Rome uh, up here, so he's down uh, here in Corinth. And Rome in Italy, same city that uh, exists today, it was the, the world city. Uh, it was the densest populated city in the world. And uh, sociologists have studied it and said in all of history, it was maybe the most dense populous city in the world. Uh, people on top of people. Uh, think Bombay, uh, India. India. Uh, it was the center of the Roman Empire. Uh, people from all over the known world came uh, to do politics and trade and commerce, uh, to buy and sell, uh, to make alliances. Uh, it literally was the center of the Roman universe. And in Rome, uh, there was a church, and that church met in multiple homes. Uh, we know the name of one couple, Priscilla and Aquila, in chapter 16, verse 5, that had a large home where people met. Uh, generally, those who were wealthy would have larger groups, and those groups all together would make up the church. We find at the end of his book, in chapter 16 uh, of Romans, the longest list of greetings by personal names of any of his letters. Why is that? It's because he had not been there. Uh, most of the people only knew him by reputation, and he knew them through other believers and other travels, so he was established a personal connection uh, with them. We don't know who founded the church in Rome. We know, contrary to church uh, traditions, it was not Peter. There is no shred of evidence Peter was there. It was almost certainly Jews uh, who were at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter's very first Christian sermon after the Holy Spirit came upon the church, he preached to this huge Pentecost crowd about Jesus Christ. And it said on that day, there were uh, men from all over the Roman world. And it names them everywhere, literally. Over, and over 3,000 in that crowd on that one day became followers of Jesus Christ. Well, those Jews would gather for the festivals and then go back out uh, into the Roman world multiple times a year. So undoubtedly, there were converts, there were Jews who went out uh, back to Rome, their homes, and they had found that Jesus was, in fact, uh, the Messiah. And then over time, uh, Gentiles, the word Gentile for the Jewish people means non-Jew. Goy is the singular. Goyim is the plural in Hebrew. I am a Goy. Uh, most of us are Goyim. So if you were not Jewish, you were a Gentile. That's what that word means uh, in Scripture. Now, what we do know for certain in this church that was roughly 25 years old, composed of Jew and Gentile believers, is that there was this a special emphasis in Romans, as we read it, you'll see it all the time, about Jew and Gentile. Uh, what happened historically is very important to understand this emphasis because there's this theme we'll encounter in Romans where he speaks to Jew and then he speaks to Gentile believers uh, back and forth and there seems to be tension. Well, what happened uh, historically, it, and we know this uh, from Roman historical records and it's also recorded in the book of Acts, in Acts 18 verse 2, uh, Luke, the author of Acts, who traveled with Paul, uh, said that Paul and company met some Roman Jewish Christians, Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth, because Claudius had expelled them. Uh, what happened was in 49 AD, uh, the emperor Claudius uh, was heard that the peace of Rome was being upset by Jews over the preaching of Christos, Christ. And to the Romans, there was no distinction between a Jewish 
Messianic Jew and an Orthodox Jew, uh, to them they were all Jews. And what was most important to Rome was the peace of Rome. And so there was this disruption, and we see it throughout Acts, wherever Paul went and preached, and some Jews became followers of Jesus and some didn't. There was often conflict, not only in the synagogue, but it would spill out into the marketplace and into the city. Uh, we see that happen to Paul over and over again. Well, Claudius would have none of it. So not making those subtle distinctions between Jewish believer and uh, not believer in Christ, he just expelled them all. There was an edict that went out, and we have it from Roman historical records. 49 AD, all the Jews had to leave Jerusalem. Now that edict lasted until 54, for five years, when Claudius died, and then Nero became emperor. So this is what happened uh, with the church. Think about this. Started by Jewish believers, and then more and more over a course of 15 uh, to 20 years, uh, Gentiles uh, became followers of Christ. But then all the Jews who were undoubtedly the foundation and probably the senior leaders of the church, they all had to leave Rome. So for a five-year period, the only people in the church in Rome were Gentile believers. Well, now we know when Paul wrote this letter in 57 AD that Priscilla and Aquila, who had been in Corinth, are now back in Rome. Uh, that's indicated in chapter 6, uh, verse 3. And so it's critical, and it doesn't take much human imagination to understand that when one group is in charge, and then they have to leave, someone else takes over, those who were still there, and then the first group comes back, they'll say, wait a minute, we were in charge. Well, no, we've been in charge for five years, right? It doesn't take much imagination at all. Kind of like when you have multiple kids and one goes off to college for four years and the younger brother takes over the bedroom and then the older brother comes back from college because he still needs a job and says, hey, you're in my bedroom, get out. And he says, wait, you've been gone four years, this bedroom's mine. That distinction, that social unrest that undoubtedly was there, that tension uh, between them, will see that theme throughout the book of Romans. Now, there are <clears throat> two common explanations for why Paul wrote Romans among scholars, and they are true in part. There's nothing false about them, but they're not sufficient explanations to explain all of the unique themes, especially this running theme of Jew and Gentile. Uh, the first general explanation is that Paul is expounding a systematic theology of the gospel of grace because it's a good thing to do. After all, he had never been to Rome. So he was laying out for them. Uh, some consider that chapter 117 through the end of 8 or through the end of chapter 11. And those chapters do read like a sermon. They do read like what he probably did preach everywhere he went with some tweaks. So that is true in part. It is true, but it's only in partly true for the entire book. It doesn't make sense of the introduction, the close, and the theme, especially we'll see in chapters 9 through 11 about God's sovereign work among the Jewish people. It is true, but not a sufficient explanation. Second explanation given is that the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, is teaching the gospel to the heart of the Gentile world, Rome. Again, there's no question, there's truth in that. It was uh, the center of the Gentile world. And as I read earlier, and we'll go back to the text in a few minutes, he specifically wanted to come to Rome to reach uh, Gentiles. Uh, that was his uh, mission. But Again, that's too general an explanation because it doesn't, again, account for chapters 9 through 11, God's work among the Jewish people. What is God doing? Has he abandoned them? Does he still have a plan for them? Now, what we have from the text is two clear reasons for writing in addition to the truth of laying out the gospel of grace uh, because Romans is the gospel of grace. First, he says he wants those in Rome to become mission partners with him in the gospel. You can find that in chapter uh, 15, 
uh, 14 uh, through 33. I won't read that now because that's a long section. Uh, but in that, he pours out his heart about his desire. He wants to come to Rome. His plan is then go to Spain because no one has gone to the West. He wants to keep moving the gospel out and forward. After he's taken the collection to the poor in Jerusalem, his plan was to come back to Rome and then go on to Spain. And he plainly says in verse 24 that he hopes they will assist him, and he uses a word that means financial assistance. In other words, he wanted them to have confidence in his work as a missionary, and he was inviting them to be a missionary church uh, to support and send him out. He's trying to stir up their passion for his passion for lost Gentiles. The second reason that is found in the letter is that he wants them to be in harmonious unity with one another because of the gospel. There's that Jew-Gentile conflict, which that kind of tension was natural in the churches then, but again exacerbated by the Jews having to leave for five years and come back. So considering that historical situation, it makes sense why Paul keeps returning, we'll see this in Rome, to the theme of harmony and unity and expressing great concern uh, about potential division between Jew and Gentile uh, within the church. Uh, that issue runs straight through the letter and is only explained by this unique historical situation that I laid out for you. So in a sense, Paul is, is laying out here these two reasons, these two issues, are the very things that cause most godly pastors uh, to lay awake at night with concern about their churches. What are those concerns? Uh, their concern for harmony or unity in the church. And second, a lack of concern for evangelism and mission. And those two are so intertwined and interconnected, it is profound because only a gospel soaked in the grace of God will be passionate about living in harmony and passionate about reaching others for Christ. Because the gospel rightly understood humbles all human pride. We realize we're all on the same level as sinners, rebellious people under the judgment of God, saved only by the mercy of God through his grace. You see, all human societies and communities even families are by nature self-centered and self-serving. And they are also unstable. Family conflict, neighborhood conflict, conflict at work, conflict in churches, conflict in the states, conflict in the world. It's throughout human history. Why? Because we're more comfortable with people just like us. Uh, we marry someone hoping they're just like us. And then we find out, oh, they're not. And the conflict begins. Party spirit and indifference to others, division and lack of care for the welfare of others are both removed by the gospel. They should have no place in a gospel-centered church. And that's what Paul is moving us towards. So the logic and the purpose of Paul's letter to the Romans gives us vision uh, to build one another up in loving harmony and to have broken hearts for the lost who are perishing without Christ. Hence my attempt at the purpose, which I'll read to you again. For God to be glorified by a united missionary church, which has been transformed by faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. So that's the setting. Uh, that's what I believe his purpose is, uh, reflected in the introduction, the conclusion, and the themes uh, within. So let's look for a few minutes at the text itself this morning. Verses 8 through 15. First, we see that Paul is thankful for their well-known faith. He says, first, I thank my God for. He was a praying man who begins with thanksgiving. And all Greek and Roman, Greco-Roman letters uh, began with wishes, as I quoted earlier, for good health. I wish good health upon you. Or I wish that my health is as good as your health and we have good health and prosperity together. Paul takes that Greco-Roman form, turns it off a human level 
turns it off that and turns it up to God, recognizing uh, that what we have is all a gift from God. He brings a focus on to what God has done in the life of the Roman church uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, and not just that they are Christ followers, but he thanks God that their faith is going out through the world. Your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Now that's a little bit of hyperbole because they haven't been to Spain yet. Uh, but it's an expression saying, you didn't just keep your faith to yourself, but your faith uh, is known throughout the world. Now, why would that be true? Because Rome was the Mecca of trade, if you will. It was the center of the world, people coming and going all the time. Boy, there's a church in Rome, and they're vibrant. They're following uh, Jesus Christ. So this theocentric prayer, instead of a wish for good health, uh, him thanking God, uh, for what he has done in the church in Rome is a great model for us in our own prayer life. He begins with thanksgiving. And whenever we pray, if we're a Christian, we always want to start with thanksgiving. Don't rush into problems. Don't rush into, I need this, this person needs that. And you, you become a worry prayer. But what we need to do first is lift our hearts up in thanksgiving for what God has done. And we can always thank God the Father for what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, one of my favorite sections in the New Testament, is we give thanks to God for all the spiritual blessings we have in Jesus Christ, and it's just one after another. I taught through Ephesians, that's on our website, and that prayer, verse 3 through 14, if you pray that occasionally as a prayer, especially to start your prayers, it will revolutionize not only your prayer life, but it will change your perspective in the moment of praying because suddenly you'll have a heavenly perspective on things and realize that maybe our little problems aren't quite so big in light of God's spiritual blessings. And the second is he prays in this section uh, that God's will will be done so that he can visit them. He, he tells them, uh, he wants them to know because they might think, well, Paul's been everywhere, but why hasn't he visited us? Well, he tells them very clearly here that he's been longing to see them. Uh, he, he's passionate uh, about that. Uh, the word he uses for longing uh, is a strong word in the Greek. It means to plead, to beg for something. Uh, it's actually used of when a baby desires mother's milk. It, it's a strong word of intimacy. He so much wants to be there, showing the depth of his desire. But he couches that to saying, I long to see you, uh, but may it be God's will. Because in God's will, it had not yet happened yet. It had not been permitted by the will of God for him to make it there. Here, people are a little glib, in my opinion, with the will of God, proclaiming the will of God and proclaiming the future. So here we have Paul the Apostle, who was physically carried into heaven and saw things in heaven that no one else ever has. Don't believe those nonsense books that are written today. They didn't see what Paul said. So the Apostle Paul could heal the sick, even with his shadow. The Apostle Paul could raise the dead. The Apostle Paul authored 13 letters of the New Testament. And if the Apostle Paul said, if God wills it, and he says it in a place of humility, so ought we. He says, I, I hope, I want to, I, I, I expect to be there. And, and let me do a Paul Harvey. Let me tell you the rest of the story. Paul did arrive in Rome, but not as he expected when he wrote the letter of Romans. A few years later, he arrived in Rome in chains as a prisoner of Rome. You'll find that in the book of Acts. Now, what does he say here is his reason for visit? You look in verse 11, it says, for, uh, that's a purpose word. I, I long to visit you for this reason. And he lays out two reasons. Verses 11 and 12, he says, for the mutual strengthening of each other's faith. You see, faith among Christians is a two-way street. Even for the Apostle Paul, when he would visit them, they would encourage uh, him and he uh, would encourage uh, them. It's not just Paul giving to them, uh, but there's a mutuality among uh, true believers. Uh, he desires to have harvest. The word literally is uh, fruit. 
meaning he wants to help them not only more fully understand the gospel, as he lays out here in his letter, but he certainly also means to evangelize in Rome because Rome was the biggest city on earth and he hadn't evangelized yet. There were plenty of people who still needed to hear the gospel. And Paul was uniquely qualified and commissioned by God uh, to preach the gospel in the first century world. He was the most effective missionary and I would say the greatest missionary that has ever lived. So he rejoices in verse 12 that they will mutually encourage one another because of what they share in Christ. Now, I've had that experience as I've traveled. I've lived in Switzerland and London uh, for a season and uh, traveled quite a bit. And whenever you meet another Christian, there's an immediate bond there. And there's an encouragement about what has God done in your life? What is God doing in your life? What are you praying about? Uh, what are you seeking God for? Uh, what can you rejoice in? How did you come to faith? There's a sharing of faith uh, that strengthens in a way that only can happen uh, between Christians. And then secondly, he goes on in these verses to emphasize the gospel is for everyone, for everyone. He repeatedly uses the word all. I won't go back and read the whole text, but I encourage you to do that. You'll see how many times he says all. He's continually making the point to the Roman church that the gospel is for Jew and Gentile because some of the early Jews thought it was just for them. And some of the Gentiles, believe it or not, thought it was just for them and that God had forgotten the Jews and it was just for them. It's sad to say that that's true in some churches today. They think it's just for their church. There are Christians who attend church and think it's just for them, but God isn't really concerned about their neighbor their family, their co-worker, and he is. God had empowered and commissioned Paul to herald the gospel to all peoples. Rome, you have to understand, was highly organized by social class, much more rigidly uh, than we were are today. Uh, those in certain Roman families, if you are a Roman citizen, uh, you would often call yourself a Greek, meaning you had Greek learning. Uh, the Greeks, the Romans were great warriors and engineers and governors, but they didn't invent anything of learning. They just took everything from the Greeks. All the Greek gods gave them new names. They took Socrates, Plato, uh, Euripides, the Greek philosophers, and turned them into uh, Roman ways of thinking. So when they say, Paul says here, uh, I am under obligation to Greek and barbarian, he's not talking about racially about Greeks, he's saying, Greeks, I am under obligation to the upper class and barbarians, the very lowest of low. And for those in the upper class in Rome, the idea that someone as educated as Paul could be concerned about people who were on the bottom of the social barrel, uh, the social ladder, uh, made no sense to them whatsoever. Uh, many people espouse Aristotle as a fountain of wisdom. Here's what Aristotle said. He said that slaves and barbarians are both inferior in nature and intelligence to true Greeks. Not a very welcoming attitude, is it? So for Paul to be under obligation to barbarian, uh, to wise and foolish, as he says, he uses double pairs of, of nouns, uh, would have been somewhat shocking uh, to the well-to-do and the educated. But the gospel insists that all humanity stands on equal footing before God. We'll see in chapter 118 through 320, we all are on equal footing as sinners, as rebels in trouble. And then that we are all on equal footing, chapter 321 through 425, with an offer of grace, to be forgiven and made children of God. So Paul is eager to bring the gospel to Rome, regardless of a person's ethnicity, citizenship, or social standing. And there was no better place in the world to reach the cross-section of humanity than Rome itself. So how much does this matter to Paul and to us? In verse 14, as I mentioned, he said he's under obligation. Uh, the word there means bound, 
tied to, restricted. He's bound, he's free, but he's bound to a sense of needing to proclaim the gospel. As a herald, uh, Paul, an apostle, was a herald of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, it's like what happened in ancient cities. In ancient wars, uh, when a king would surround a city with a siege and that city would give up, the king would then send his herald in with a proclamation of victory. And he would offer a free pardon to the rebels in the city, those who had resisted him, if they would come and bow their knee and confess that he was their king. They would submit completely uh, to this king. And if they did, the king would pardon them. Now, that wasn't true of the Assyrians, sadly. They just killed everybody. But bowing the knee because of the herald proclamation of the graciousness of the king, but if you did not bow the knee and submit to the king, you incur the king's wrath. It's that sense of urgency that Paul is saying, we are all in trouble with God because of our rebelliousness and our sin. But he sent me to tell you about an offer of pardon, of freedom, of sonship, of an equal inheritance with Jesus Christ, of a future uh, so wonderful it's beyond your imagination. This is what Paul feels an obligation to bring and what he is bound to. That is why he says in verse 16 that he's eager uh, to preach to everyone. So that leaves you and me with two questions this morning. Number one, is your heart, is my heart, is our focus on the gospel that has humbled us, that grace has humbled us, so that we know we stand before God with no merit of our own, educated or not, wealthy or not, we all stand humbly, before God? Do we understand in our hearts that we're no better than anyone else? That what we have received is simply out of the kindness of God? And so that we can be unified with all others who have experienced that kindness? And secondly, do we have that sense of obligation? Do you, do I, have that sense of obligation that Paul did to offer the gospel of grace <clears throat> to others who don't know Jesus Christ. Now, you're not going to get on a ship and go to Rome. But you have family. You have friends. You have co-workers who don't know Jesus. That is, if you know him. Are each of us who call ourselves Christians but do we have this sense of obligation that Paul has because we've been humbled by grace? And if not, perhaps that's something we need to pray about. We need to consider how far away we are from that in our hearts. Have we vainly thought we've become something better? and forgotten we came by grace and mercy? Have we lost a passion for others to receive the gift of eternal life that we have received? You see, the reason for Paul writing applies to every church that claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. God needs to be glorified in our life by our united efforts as a church because we've been transformed by faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. May the Lord make that true for my heart, for your heart, for our church, Grace Point, and for all who are listening. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, pray that for yourself and for the heart, that you, the church that you are committed to. And friends, if you don't know Jesus Christ, keep tuning into this series. But the offer of grace is there. You built your own castle, your own city, your own kingdom. Uh, you've been that rebel. You told God no. Every human being has. But the conquering king comes offering not to put you in prison, 
but instead he offers you grace. He offers you mercy. You admit you're a rebel. You believe that in Jesus Christ, his grace is offered through his death and resurrection. And by surrendering to him and asking him to take over your life, he'll forgive you, he'll make you his child, and he'll give you a future. We'll discover that beautifully in the book of Romans. And if you'd like to know more about what that means, go to our church website at gracepoint, with an E, G-R-A-C-E-P-O-I-N-T-E dot org. And there's a contact form. Uh, email us uh, there, contact us and say, I'd like a free book. We have a book that we want to send you that will tell you about the last week of Jesus Christ and what it means to be a Christian. So I'm going to pray for all of us. Father, may you make it true in my heart, in all of our hearts, in all of our churches, that we would have the passion of Paul, humbled by grace, concern to share your glorious gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. I hope to see you back next week. We'll look at chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, the thesis statement of the next eight chapters of Romans. God bless you. Have a great day.